and um, kind of I'm going to start off by giving some motivation uh, about what the Dirichlet theorem is and then um, move on to give, well, attempt to give a proof of the theorem. It is quite long, so I am going to um, skip a couple of the details, but um, there I've, I'll give references when I hand out my notes later on. Um, this presentation is basically based off my dissertation, which in turn is based off uh, Sarah and Everson Ward and also Stephen's um, number theory notes. Um, so yeah, um, Dirichlet, the, this proof of Dirichlet theorem is basically um, a standard proof that you'll find anywhere, um, but I've kind of put it all together in one place and hopefully give enough motivation so we can figure out what's going on. Uh, but the, fir the first thing um, I want to talk about is kind of something we've all heard about, um, the proof of infinitely many primes by Euclid. Um, uh, the proof, as you would probably know, goes like, suppose for contradiction, there are only a finite number of primes. And then you kind of enumerate these primes, multiply them all together and add one to them. And then we can claim that um, this number is either prime itself or actually it has a prime divisor greater than any of the primes in the list. And this is a contradiction to our original statement that there are finitely many primes. Hence, um, there is an infinite number of primes. So that, that's, that's like a simple proof of um, by Euclid. And actually, we can do something similar. Um, I'm going to write this down. Um, so I'm going to give a quick lemma first. And I'm going to try and prove that there are infinitely many primes, uh, 3 mod 4. So on division by 4, they give a remainder of 3. So the lemma is lemma. Um, if we have a number, if n is congruent to 3 mod 4, then there exists some prime factor. There exists a uh, p dividing n prime uh, such that p gives a remainder of 4, uh, gives a remainder of 3 um, on division by 4. And this proof, the proof of this is simple. Suppose not, then um, n is well, n is uh, 3 mod 4 and every prime divisor is 1 mod 4, then that means that when you multiply them all together, um, n is 1 mod 4, hence we have a contradiction, hence n is, uh, in fact, has at least one divisor um, with the 3 mod 4. And we need this lemma to prove the following theorem. Um, there are infinitely many primes of the form three mod four. And um, the proof of this is actually very similar to Euclid's proof. I will uh, quickly write it down right here. Uh, it uses the lemma from above. Um, so proof. How do I get rid of this 100% thing? There we go. Um, suppose for contradiction, as every uh, Euclid type proof starts, um, suppose uh, there are finitely many primes p mod 3, finite p 3 mod 4. Um, and uh, let's enumerate them, let these be p1 up to some finite pn, and then we let our kind of, uh, we multiply all these together, um, then we multiply it by 4, and then we subtract 1, and clearly this is greater, or, uh, greater than or equal to 2. And we claim that in here's a remainder of three on division by four. And this is quite easy to see because um, the first thing in n is a, uh, well, yeah, it's obvious. It's negative one mod four, so it's three mod four. Um, 
then by the lemma, since n is 3 mod 4, there exists some uh, prime, uh, let's call this prime q, there exists q um, 3 mod 4, such that q divides n q prime. Um, and this is by the lemma. Um, and then we can see where we're going with this. So since Q is 3 mod 4, and there are only a finite number of primes 3 mod 4, that means Q must be in our original list. And then that means Q divides 4 times P1 all the way up to Pn, since Q is actually one of the Pi's, and uh, Q also divides n. And then putting these together um, by simple division um, properties, Q divides the difference. And this difference is actually 1, because um, n is this thing minus 1. Actually, uh, let's make that negative 1. And um, the only prime dividing negative one, well, actually, there are no primes dividing negative one. And this is a contradiction. Uh, thus, there must be an infinite number of primes, three mod four. Now, the obvious kind of extension to this is, can we replicate this proof for every kind of uh, relationship like this? Um, maybe, say, uh, five mod 13 or something, a uh, 5 mod 12. Um, but, well, I'm going to uh, kind of uh, question. For every arithmetic progression, A plus N D for uh, ranging for um, N in the natural numbers, um, and also with GCD of A and D1. Um, our question is, is there an infinite number of primes in this set? And um, this is actually Dirichlet theorem. So this is what I'm going to try and prove, that there are an infinite number of primes in every arithmetic progression you can think of. And note that um, our problem from above, uh, 3 mod 4, that's also an arithmetic progression since A is 1 and uh, N, uh, D is 3. So it's everything of, sorry, that is not right. It should be 3 plus um, 4 N. That was the uh, kind of our motivation problem. And um, the Rishley theorem will prove this in full generality. So I am going to go and clear all and then move to somewhere and start with the actual proof. So uh, the proof of the Rishley theorem, well, uh, the Rishley theorem is basically an uh, analytic number theory problem. So it involves a lot of um, analysis and looking at the Riemann zeta function. Uh, the first thing we do, though, is quite group theoretic. So um, we look at Dirichlet characters, obviously named after Dirichlet. Um, so we define a Dirichlet uh, character. Um, and the Dirichlet, uh, well, we define a Dirichlet character mod sum n as a function um, uh, whatever this letter is, chi, um, from the integers to the complex numbers, such that um, this function chi restricted to um, the integers mod uh, n and those that are co-prime to those um, to c star is a homomorphism, is a character if the thing is a homomorphism. And also we need one more condition that chi of m is zero if the GCD of m and n is not one. Um, so basically, 
the Dirichlet character is a homomorphism on kind of the, the numbers co prime to n and for the numbers that are pri uh, that 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 have a common factor um the directly character gives zero and um we also define kind of a special directly character chi one uh this is what we call the identity character and uh this is simply defined to be um zero if a is um 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 um, um has a gcd greater than one so if a is zero mod n and one otherwise this should probably not be zero this just write gcd of a and n greater than one it's easy to see that way um yeah so this is the um identity character and the reason why we call this the identity character is because it actually um we can we can uh relate it towards the identity um in fact the group of all characters for some n is dual to um z modded in z and the proof of that is somewhere i believe it's in everson ward if you were keen uh to look at it but um, we don't really need that much here. So the first thing I'm going to do is try and give a couple of proofs and the kind of uh, properties of the Dirichlet character. So proposition thingy, um, Bob. Um, proposition: a Dirichlet character um, maps every a Dirichlet character. I'm just going to write characters so I don't have to write so much maps um, z upon n z star to the um, to the nth uh, phi nth actually phi nth roots of unity obviously on the complex numbers and um, the easiest way well uh, what do we need how do we show this? Well, we just have to show that um, when we raise it to this thing, we get one. And yeah, indeed. So since it's the homomorphism, um, chi of one must be one. Uh, and it must also be by uh, uh, for, for every G, Let's just write this out for all G in our uh, ba in our base uh, group, and uh, this is just obvious from the properties of a homomorphism. And then um, we need just to try and prove uh, our next property, which is something I call well, everyone calls the orthogonality relations um right so i first um take a character let's go um so let kai be a character mod n then the following hold we have um the sum of all the chi i's uh running from uh uh one to n so we're changing the thing inside the function and this is equal to phi in if uh chi is the identity and it's zero otherwise and then our second property runs over all the um, characters. So it run, it's, um, runs on all the characters, chi's, and there are phi in of those um, just by looking at the dual or um, uh, actually, yeah, um, looking at the possibilities for where each element goes to. You can find out their phi in of them and 
Um, well, just some. Similarly, is phi n if um, um, if I the thing in the inside is one mod m and zero otherwise. And how much space do I have left? Okay. And the proof of this is quite simple. I am only going to prove the first one. The second one, um, you can look at the notes. Actually, I will send out the notes in the chat right now so you can follow along. Um, or just look at probably Everest and Wardle um, would, would have a page or two on it. So um, we take it in cases. So if Kai was indeed the identity, then the sum counting the elements um, in our base group, well, it, it counts the number of elements in the base group, and that's phi n. So that means um, our sum is phi n and there's nothing to do. So um, then done. So we consider chi not the identity. And we choose an element in mod n such that uh, chi of this element a is not one. Then we have the following: we have um, We're just going to use the property of uh, sums for the first thing. So chi of a times the sum is the sum of the products. And then um, we can use the property that it is a homomorphism to get that we have chi of a i. And then since a is um, not one, then that means a multiplying by a itself is a isomorphism. It's an automorphism on the uh, uh, numbers mod n. So that means each a i maps to a different i, and so the sum is actually chi of i and. Um, well, you see here this thing, this thing, they cancel out. So that means, um, uh, 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 what do we get? We get, we get, um, well, actually they don't cancel out. But what, what we first need to know is that chi of A is, um, say, it's not, not equal to zero. We have, uh, well, okay, so we need to prove that this sum itself is not zero and, uh, sorry, I'm getting myself confused. No, so chi of a is not equal to one. And how do we know that? Well, since a was arbitrary, that means that if chi of a was one, that means chi is the identity, but we assumed it wasn't. So that means since that is not one, that means that this the sum here is equal to zero, and which is what we wanted. And that proves uh, this proposition here, proposition 1.4 in the notes. Well, uh, the first part, the second part, um, if you look at the notes, it's very similar. We um, kind of do a fancy cancellation trick. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you look at that in your own time. Um, the next thing uh, on the list is the Richley series. Um, but first of all, I want to give a definition, um, and this is going to look something similar to what we want to prove. So it's obvious why we need this. So we define some uh, a set of primes with uh, uh, a and d variables, um, and we assume a and d coprime. This is the set. Um, this is the set for A and D coprime. Um, 
that's just going to make writing things a bit easier from there here on wood. So um, the next definition is a Dirichlet series. I'm going to prove a couple of properties about the Dirichlet series, and from there we can um, we can prove kind of results on the, the Dirichlet theorem itself. So definition. And this is where things start getting analytic. So let S be in the complex numbers, then we define, well, we define kind of a sum n equals one. This thing here, if you've seen the Riemann, uh, 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 the, 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 the um, what do you call it? The Riemann zeta, uh, zeta function, this kind of might remind you of it and indeed, uh, the proof of Dirichlet series uh, looks, uh, Dirichlet theorem looks at uh, ring zeta function. Uh, so this thing we call a Dirichlet series for some s, and um, we call this the Dirichlet L function, uh, 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 which kind of lets s vary. And this is obviously we define this over the domain of convergence. So L doesn't always converge, the sum doesn't always converge. Um, but we'll figure out when it converges, and that's our next theorem. So actually, I labeled it as a proposition. So let's make it a proposition. Um, our Dirichlet L function. Oh, hi, Oliver. Um, so our Dirichlet L function is, um, uh, I claim that this converges absolutely. Uh, for uh, S, the, the real part of S bigger than one. So when, when the real part of S is greater than one and also, when it converges, um, the Dirichlet L function, the thing up here, uh, we say that we can say that the product it's the same as the product of one minus this inverse. And well, uh, yeah, um, the proof of this is quite analytic. We have to look at the sums, the products. Um, the first part is actually quite easy to see. Um, so uh, the fact that it converges absolutely um, is because that chi, uh, the characters are all bounded. Um, well, in fact, they are all, they mapped onto the uh, unit circle in the complex numbers. So hence they must be bounded and then um, the sum, uh, 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 we have to also note that th this thing here, the sum from one to infinity of one over n to the t for um, some t greater than one, um, this converges. Hence, um, L converges, absolutely. So yeah, that, that part is pretty simple to show. The second part is uh, kind of requires a couple more lines to work out. And um, so we first um, kind of proved this on some finite set S. So let S be a finite set of prime numbers, be a finite. of primes and then we let n of s be the um, be the um, actually let's just be lazy n of s is the um, set of all divisors of primes belonging to s sorry it's the set of all okay let's let's right so it's the set of all it's the set of all natural numbers under the restriction that um, some prime divides in for some prime inside S. Um, yeah, so it's a set of natural numbers whose prime factors belong to S. Uh, 
Um, then, since um, chi is a homomorphism, um, then we can split it up, and that means we can actually split this sum here into a product the thing here and let's think of this for uh think think about this for a little moment um well chi is a homomorphism hence we can split this up and that's where the product comes from and we can split it up because um uh, the prime divisors are all uh, co-prime and that sort of stuff, and uh, that's why we can split it up uh, into P inside S. And then obviously the bottom half uh, also we can split up normally since that's just a number. Um, right. And then this is where it gets really analytic and I'm not the best at analytic stuff, so I am going to probably make a mistake or two, but I'm sure we can get through it. So um, we let S, our original set of, uh, of uh, original finite set of primes, and we let that kind of get bigger and bigger. And then we can rearrange the sum because um, we have absolute convergence. So that means n of s actually tends towards the natural numbers as s gets larger. And yeah, with absolute uh, convergence, everything is fine. We can rearrange the sum without uh, changing the actual value of the sum. So our original um, L function, that's the limit. And that's the, oh, I can't. Um, that's by definition, and then uh, we can write it out like that. So we get this thing, except this time instead of, uh, well, since S gets uh, large, so it's uh, for every prime P, and remember there are an infinite number of them, and this is equal to uh, this thing over one, one over that thing. And uh, that's true, so we can get from there to there because um, whatever I've written here, I've written it because um, the real part of S is bigger than one, Yep, and then we also have that, uh, oh yeah, we have that. Uh, this thing here, um, since uh, chi is in the unit circle, so it's actually equal to this thing, and that's less than or equal to minus two to the minus s, which is less than one, hence we can uh, change the sum into, uh, the thing, uh, binomial expansion or whatever it's called. It's not called the binomial expansion, it's something along those lines. Um, right. So I've proved that, um, I've proved this proposition that the L function is actually the product of one minus chi of P over P to the S all uh, inverted. And then as a corollary, um, we can actually say that this is a what have i written here um since oh right um so for some uh finite number we can kind of uh omit a finite number of p and uh, that's fine as well or some D, I don't know where that D comes from. So let's skip that corollary because we don't need it. Um, and then now um, we kind of 
I listed a couple of lemmas and theorems inside the notes. I am going to try and make my way towards them now. So I'm going to stop this screen share and start this screen share here. Right, uh, sorry. Um, so we are here. So this lemma here, lemma 1.9, um, uh, we need to show that the limit of S tends to one of the sum here that's equal to the limit of the log. Uh, this is proved by Riemann zeta. I do not really, ha I didn't really have time to look at this uh, in detail. So if you go to reference one, page 70, that's there. Uh, it kind of does all this in a very short space of time. Um, as you know, Sierra is very concise. Um, and it also proves that this, um, this double sum is bounded and also that um, if we don't have the identity character, then uh, the L function is non-zero. So um, just keep these in mind. We will um, need them later. I'm going to figure out how to stop the share here and then go back to here. Why is Zoom being annoying? Okay, and there we go. So our next theorem, oh, sorry. So our next lemma um, is this thing. And this is actually something we can prove quite easily. Why, why does everything look weird now? Zoom in the wall, zoom, get out. Okay. Um, so, um, right, so our next lemma, so the limit of s goes to one of log of s minus one for any s is actually the sum is the sum oh this d should this should be an s there yeah. no it checks it should be a d it's, it's an arbitrary d and um this d will end up being our um uh our kind of our product thing inside our original set that we wanted to prove was infinite so if we recall we had this, this set here we had so we wanted to prove that every arithmetic progression was infinite um so every set of this form is infinite provided a and d were co-prime and this d corresponds to that d there um but at the current stage, D could be anything. Right. So to prove this, um, we just need to use kind of the previous lemma, um, the ones that I didn't prove because I'm too lazy. Um, so this sum here um, kind of differs. Well, this sum, this sum here is I'm I'm just gonna write it out again. So the sum here is um also this thing. And it's almost the same as um the same thing um except 
p ranges over every prime um the only things we don't we take out are uh, every prime divided of d so that means if we kind of um take limits and um if we use the lemma um what did i label it as um lemma 1.8 i think um then um we get so so we take we take s goes to one and um uh this thing that was by the thing we proved earlier and then um that's equal to this limit here by the lemma i didn't prove and then that's um that kind of shows that equality there between the limit and the sum. Since um, P here only, uh, uh, the, the sum differs only by a finite number of terms. Right, um, so the next thing, what's the time now? I am, how much do I have to do? I have to, I'm going to skip the next lemma, and by skip I mean I'm going to just show the PDF. So this uh, lemma 1.13, you can't see my screen because I haven't shared yet. Right, there we go. So uh, lemma 1.13, um, we want to, um, we claim that the limit of S goes to one of this sum here, the sum of uh, every prime not dividing D of uh, the character at P over P to the S is bounded as long as our character was not the identity. So uh, we take such a character and we define a logarithm kind of uh, in the formal sense. Um, we take it to be the log of one of one minus x is equal to this sum here that's uh, in the usual way provided that the uh, size of x is less than one and this is all analytic stuff so the reason why why this is the log we normally know uh, just taking that analysis course and um then for uh the, for kind of um is large enough and um, we have this thing here, um, which you will recognize from before, then we can take the logarithms of both sides. Well, we take the log of this thing here um, and we can deduce these couple of lines, blah, blah, blah. I don't feel like explaining it now. I'll explain it next time if we have time or, yeah, um, when I have a whiteboard, when we do the thing in person next week. Um, and um yeah so uh this thing is equal to this thing and um since l is bounded then the log is bounded and since uh this double sum was bounded by the lemma hence this single sum is bounded and in this lemma i'm also gonna skip through really quickly um we have this big thing here, um, the sum of p to the minus s that kind of looks like a Riemann zeta type thing, uh, it's equal to uh, phi of d inverse of the sum here. And we do this by um, kind of considering the orthogonality relationships um, in the step here uh, of the character. And all right, and swapping sums is possible because of absolute convergence. Um, yeah, so as you can see, everything kind of before falls into place, and we get this lemma here. Um, we're one step away from proving the Richley theorem. It doesn't seem like it, but somehow we are.
almost there. Um, right. So back to me writing here and start sharing on the other screen. I don't get why Zoom keeps that flashing thing down there, but yeah, I have to make do. Right. Um, so the Rishay theorem. So the first thing um, to talk about is a notion we call density. Um, why? Um, so let A be any set inside P. Uh, we let P be the uh, the set. Uh, yeah, we let the set P be the set of all primes, and uh, so any for for any subset of the primes, uh, we call the density um, in the density. Uh, of A is, um, I'm just going to write it down and explain it. So, so kind of, if you look at the sum here, it's basically kind of a bit of hand waving, it's the size of A over the size of S. Um, and actually from our previous work, we know that this is actually the limit of um, it, it, It's a thing here um, because, uh, well, we basically cancel stuff off um, the bottom thing bottom thing uh, is, is the thing here. And our, uh, yeah, and if we let this thing be k, we note that k is a number between 0 and 1. And that's because um, this thing up the top is always smaller than this thing. Um, yeah, so that's why we call it a density, because it's the size of the small thing divided by the size of the big thing. And Dirichlet theorem, um, or kind of a general version of Dirichlet theorem, states that this set, which uh, recall was, um, let me get the order right, a plus n d for n in natural numbers. Um, the set here has density um, 1 over phi of d. And um, from here we can uh, prove kind of what we were out to prove. Uh, but I'll prove this thing first. So to do this um, requires everything we did before. So obviously the first thing we do is let chi be a character mod b and then we have um, the limit of this sum uh, with another sum inside and this doesn't make sense. To, I mean, it, it, it doesn't make sense at first glance. Um, and uh, it's something, I mean, you could probably poke at it and uh, uh, understand it after kind of a couple of reads, basically. Uh, but we get, um, so I'll just write it all out. So it's the identity.
So it's this thing, and and we know we already know that uh, the thing at the bottom is log of s minus one. And um, this is because kind of um, if you've been following things, um, uh, 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 the sum this the sum here uh, is bounded if uh it's not the identity and um um uh it goes to the log here um so yeah oh wait so no so it's bound it's bounded if it's not the identity and it goes to the, the uh logarithm if it is the identity and then um because uh we can we can uh go further um we went from here to here also because this thing here is just one because it's identity, so it maps A to one. And um, here we use the fact that A and D was co-prime. Uh, if it was no, not co-prime, uh, then it, the proof fails at this step because chi of one of A uh, is zero and um, uh, everything blows up. And then we have by one of our lemmas from before, that um, if we just keep going, we get um, So we get this thing, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm not gonna write this as well. And yeah, uh, this follows from the last lemma of uh, the previous section. Um, uh, 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 this thing here, um, it's literally just restating it, and then now we can kind of um divide through by everything and we so um um what am i doing so th this thing here is kind of the top thing of our density and then the um and recall on the bottom we had the sum of uh one over p to the s for every prime p um, so we divide by that, and actually that thing is um, from our previous work is um, minus one over mi minus one divided by kind of the log thing. So um, it, it's just let k be the d density of the set uh, p of a comma d, and what I'm trying to say, uh, we already had this. And then from the previous line, this kind of falls out since this cancels out with this. So this is phi of D inverse. And yeah, so that proves the Richley theorem. And then kind of the exciting part, a corollary to the Richley theorem, um, which is kind of the Richley theorem I was talking about was that uh the, the set uh every arithmetic progression is infinite uh has infinite number of primes and why is this well um a finite set has density zero and we can see that quite simply from definition because we have a finite number of things on the top and then the bottom thing is uh ha has an infinite set since there's an infinite number of primes uh so the limit goes to zero. And that means um, if, well, our density was um, phi of the inverse and this thing isn't zero for um, 
any natural number, and hence um, our, our, our every arithmetic progression has a infinite number of primes, and that concludes the Rishi theorem. Um, I guess from why I mean, apart from obviously the curiosity of the Rishi theorem and um, kind of it, it's got importance. Well, it's got kind of applications, if you can even call them applications. But um, if you look at, if you've heard of the Green Tower Theorem um, and the paper, um, they kind of have a extension to the Rishi Theorem. I think the paper is like 40 pages long. Though, um, and it, um, from memory, it states that, uh, uh, um, um, the, the, the set, um, the set, the, the set here, um, cont uh, when ordered um, in the normal sense, um, contained an arbitrary long sequence of primes. Or well, I should say that every arithmetic, so if you have, if you have um, a arithmetic progression, um, so, so if we had some A and D, if we had A plus D, a plus 2d, a plus 3d, so on and so forth, then um, for it's got an arbitrary long sequence of primes. The Rishi theorem tells us there's an infinite number of them. Green Tau tells us that they come consecutively. And yeah, so basically there's a lot of work going on around this sort of stuff. I think it probably has links to some of the open